tonight we have a special guest speaker, uh, Dr. Robert Garcia, uh, who is a uh, associate professor of philosophy uh, here at A and M. So he'll come and talk to us a little bit about environmentalism, uh, Christian ethics, and things of that nature. So please welcome Dr. Garcia. Awesome. All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, the invitation to come talk. And um, so. Zach chose this interesting title for me. Um, what is Jerusalem to do with Yosemite? Christian ethics and environmentalism. Um, I thought I'd say a little bit about who I am so you know sort of the kinds of things that I'm interested in and write about. Uh, and then I'll say something about the topic and then sort of how I'm gonna proceed. So uh, I did my undergraduate degree in communication, uh, which is like why I like to mumble a lot and say things like this and you can't understand what I'm saying. So, so. See? it did me a lot of good. Uh, then I went and did a master's degree at Talbot School of Theology, uh, basically a degree in philosophy of religion, uh, where I worked with J.P. Moreland and Bill Craig. And then I went to Notre Dame, did my PhD, and I worked with lots of people, uh, including Alvin Plantinga. Um, I say all that because I guess I've, I feel like I've been in the apologetics world for a long time. And, um, and I've, I know lots of people who work in this field and um, uh, I have a lot of respect for it, and it meant a lot to me when I was an undergraduate. Um, back then, all we had was Josh McDowell, um, or it seemed that way. Uh, and things have radically changed since then. Um, so that's, that's kind of me. The kinds of things I, I work on, uh, I'm a metaphysician. That's kind of my center of gravity. Um, I also work in philosophy of religion. I dabble in ethics, like environmental ethics. Um, I've written on all these things. Uh, so the kinds of things that I'm interested in uh, with respect to metaphysics, um, I'm interested in, in, sounds silly, but I'm interested in what there is, that's one way to put it, on the fundamental structure of the world. Um, just to give you a concrete example of the kinds of questions uh, that I like to ask or you know, try and answer are things like, are there ecosystems, right? Or are, we just, are they just useful fictions? Um, you're perplexed by that question, right? Yeah, we all, you know, I have Jason West. He's an ecosystem scientist, and he and I talk about ecosystems sometimes, and he agrees. Like, uh, ecosystem scientists largely just act as if there are ecosystems, and the big question is whether there really are ecosystems or if it's just a useful fiction. Um, so that's a teaser. But the, it's relevant for environmental ethics because if there are no ecosystems, then we can't have any obligations to ecosystems. Um, so... Uh, I also do work in sort of the, the nature of uh, the divine attributes and how God's, uh, uh, his so-called divine sustenance operates with the world, the way in which God sustains the world moment to moment in existence. Uh, I work on that question and how uh, you and I and everything stands in that uh, divine action. Um, and I have uh, interest in the nature of heaven. I've written a paper on that with a friend. And um, that whether, whether we have freedom and in what sense we're free in the afterlife under a Christian conception of heaven with certain assumptions. Um, so, uh, and I most recently, I spent a lot of time working on C.S. Lewis. I'm working on a book on C.S. Lewis, on his views about the uniqueness of persons. And I teach a class on it. And I have some of my students here. Um, I'm in the spring, so right now I'm teaching my fourth my fourth time to teach the Lewis course. In the spring, I'll be teaching two sections of it, an undergrad section, and then for the first time, a graduate seminar on C.S. Lewis. So if you're a grad student or know any grad students who are interested in Lewis, let me know, and uh, you're welcome to, to come. Okay, um, so this is a talk about environmental ethics, roughly. Um, but sadly, it's not the kind of talk that goes really well on social media or things like that, because you know, what, you, what people like and want and put up on social media are really provocative, sort of dogmatic, strongly asserted sound bites that have no nuance or no qualifications whatsoever. And I'm on the other extreme. Uh, my main goal tonight is to give you a bunch of qualifications and nuances that you have to consider even to think carefully about environmental ethics. So um, the way I'm going to proceed is um, if you look at your handout, uh, I have a section, I just call it preliminaries, and there are four issues here that, that are important to keep in mind. They're interrelated, but you have to kind of keep your eyes on them. 
uh, because it's easy to confuse moral issues with three other kinds of issues. Um, that's sort of stage setting. Um, in the second section, I introduced what's called the question of the moral community. Community. Um, this is one of the most important questions in, in ethics. Um, and then after I introduce that question, uh, I'll show you some of the different leading answers to it. Um, and that's a way of saying, here's this big question, here's a taxonomy of views. So if you take a course in environmental ethics, you'll study all these views. Um, and then that, those are all general though, right? And then, so the next thing that we'll look at is a specific case for application. Uh, and the one that makes, you know, is most effective for making you uncomfortable is the one I've chosen, namely whether we should eat animals or not, right? So hopefully you've all eaten your dinner already. Um, so under what conditions is it morally permissible to eat animals? Um, that's just a specific application question. And we'll look at, we'll look at that. And then uh, it's only at that point that we really approach uh, issues that are distinctively Christian in their content. And then I'll mention a few of those. Um, and by then I'll be out of time, I bet. Um, uh, but then I'll, I'll mention a few, a few odds and ends that are worth thinking about. So I don't intend to answer uh, the main question down there about eating animals. I rather want you to see how it's situated in a bigger discussion and how there's other moving parts that are relevant for it. And to just kind of give you a few things to uh, walk away with to wrestle with that question. So that's what I'm up to today. Okay, um, so preliminaries. Um, so the main thing we want to get to is the moral question, the moral issues, and those are questions that you pose with the word ought or ought not or should or should not in them. So, uh, or words like moral obligation. So is it ever morally wrong to eat animals, right? That's a moral question. Is it morally wrong to, um, to lie, right? Just those are just straightforward moral questions. Um, however, uh, especially in environmental ethics, um, empirical issues are everywhere. And often when you sort of have a discussion with somebody else about a moral issue and you, and you disagree, if your conversation goes long enough, uh, half the time you discover that you don't have a moral disagreement. You just disagree about the, what the facts are, what the empirical facts are. So empirical issues are really important to get clear on and not to confuse them with with moral issues. Um, I find this to be really helpful because when I talk to other people, um, there's a sense in which if you feel like you're in a moral disagreement, uh, the, the discussion seems a lot more charged. You feel like more is at stake. You're more likely to accuse them of being evil or some, uh, you know, there's something wrong with you or something. Um, but if you realize it's just you, you disagree about what the empirical facts are, it's like, oh, okay, like we, we're on the same moral ground, we just think that the facts, the, the, the empirical facts are different, right? So just a, a simple example would be, um, is capital punishment an effective deterrent, right? Empirical question, go ask the, you know, a statistician or whoever, whoever knows the answer to that question, right? That's an empirical issue, right? Is it an effective deterrent? Of course, that's relevant to whether capital punishment should be sort of prohibited or not. Right. So is it wrong to uh, inflict capital punishment on somebody? Well, many people think that at least part of this has to do with whether it's an effective deterrent or not. If it is an effective deterrent, then maybe it is morally justified. If it's not, maybe it's not. Does that make sense? I'm just trying to give a simple example. Um, so other empirical issues that are relevant for today, um, the first one is just animal psychology. Right. So which animals are sentient, if any, other than us? Um, uh, what kind of cognitive life does a salmon have, right? We eat them. Uh, what about chickens or pigs? Pigs are said to be more intelligent than dogs, but we eat the pigs and not the dogs, at least around here. Um, so questions about animal psychology, right? Those aren't moral questions. If I ask, hey, what kind of cognitive life does this pig have? You know, you, just, you don't ask an ethicist that question, right? Um, but the questions about psychology are important, or they at least are at least seem important, because if you think that sentient animals have more sort of moral standing than non-sentient animals, uh, like this podium doesn't have any sentience, as far as we know. Uh, so you know, it's perfectly fine to 
mistreat it or beat it up or whatever. But if there was a, there was a cat up here and I was just thumping on it, you'd be a little more concerned, right? Um, it wouldn't go over so well. Uh, so whether or not something is sentient and whether it can feel pain and to what extent and what, what it's like to be that kind of animal, um, difficult questions. But these are empirical questions uh, and they're relevant. Um, Another one is uh, facts about human nutrition. So, you know, to uh, the average human being, how much uh, animal protein does a person need in a given week to meet their nutritional needs? Not a moral question, right? What if it turns out the answer is none, right? Just what if, right? Some people say, oh, just take this little B vitamin once a, once a month and you're fine, right? That's one answer people have given. I'm not a nutritionist, so I just work with kind of what the credible people say and hope they're right. Uh, but they even disagree, so that's a problem. But, um, but if it's supposed, just work with the assumption that uh, you don't need any animal protein to meet your nutritional needs, right? Well then, you know, it's, it's a little harder to justify eating animals if you don't need to for nutritional purposes. Okay, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to sort of settle that argument, I'm trying to sort of uh, show you the, how the empirical claim is relevant by pointing to some of the moral issues that it's connected to. Uh, causal impacts, so this is a big one. So some people say, hey, you vote with your fork, right? So uh, that our, our, as consumers, our choices are morally significant, right? And the best example is if you discover your sweater was made in a sweatshop, right, in some other country by little children who are making, you know, a penny a day or something like that, you might think, oh, uh, I shouldn't wear this. I probably shouldn't buy it if I know that's where it came from. How many of you feel that way? Like, shouldn't buy sweatshop made clothing? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's kind of hard to <laughs> say no to that. Um, but the usual rationale behind it is, well, uh, at least one rationale is that if you purchase these things, you're somehow complicit or somehow you're you know, you're part of the problem. You at least have a moral obligation not to buy those things because maybe abstaining from buying those things uh, will, you know, change the situation uh, for those children or something like that. Does that make sense? I hope, that, I hope that's a familiar line of thought. Um, so the same line of thought gets rolled out in whether we should eat animals, right? Hey, these animals in, from factory farms, intensive farming conditions, um, horrific conditions, right, we're told. Uh, well, if you buy that, uh, chunk of ground beef or chicken breast from HEB, you know, isn't it, aren't you in the same way, like, it, not to the same degree, you're not saying these are on par, but isn't it like buying a sweater from a sweatshop, if you know that's where it came from, right? If you think there's something wrong with the origins of something, uh, that's relevant to whether you have moral obligations to buy or not buy or abstain or buy something else. Um, so that has to do with causal impacts, right? But that's, I just gave you kind of the, um, the simple way of thinking about it. But it's actually not so obvious that my choices as a consumer change anything on the ground when it comes to the factories or the agricultural practices, right? So the question, the empirical question is, do, do my choices as a consumer actually make any sort of difference to the origins, what's happening on the farms, right? If they don't, then you lose a kind of argument for, uh, the, um, you lose a kind of premise that's relevant for that moral argument, right? If it does, right, then you still have the argument, right? Of course, what's really the case is we just have a hard time knowing, right? And for most of these empirical issues, they're radically underdetermined, right? We're like, well, we don't, you know, we have some reason to think, you know, that lots of fish are sentient now. People think that now. Um, but of course, it's not the kind of evidence that's compelling to everybody, and it's certainly not any kind of absolute proof or something like that. So how do you make moral decisions? How do you form beliefs about moral claims when they sort of are appealing to empirical premises uh, for which we don't have super strong, compelling evidence, right? Well, welcome to the real world. <laughs> that's just the world we live in, and it's true for almost anything we anything that's important to believe, um, it's just messy, right? And so we have to think about uh, what to do. Um, we're trying to form rational beliefs and the evidence is, 
is kind of mixed, right? Or just difficult to make out. Or you don't know who to trust, right? Who should you believe when it comes to nutrition, right? You got ex so-called experts on, on all over the place, right? Um, at least I find it extremely difficult to sort all that out, right? So here's a question for you to think about. If you're in a, if you're in a context like that where, just go with nutrition, you're trying to decide what's the best sort of, for nutritional purposes, set aside ethics. Uh, what's the best diet to have, right? Um, and you go to Barnes & Noble and you stand in the aisle and you're like, shoot, look at all these books. Like, and everybody's got a PhD after their name. Everybody's got great endorsements and they're saying flatly contradictory things. What do you do? <laughs> it's very difficult. I mean, but that's, um, that's part of the problem that we face. So I think what we need is to think about how to handle that situation, right? That's, it's more important uh, at least at this stage in thinking about moral issues, to know how to handle disagreement like that and what to do with it. That's more important, I think, than coming to a firm conclusion tonight about whether you should eat animals. Right. Okay. Um, okay, those are empirical issues. Uh, then we have epistemic issues. <laughs> um, first, the first one to say is we're all biased, right? I mean... We, uh, most of us eat meat, quite a lot of it, especially here in Texas. And um, here it's part of our culture. Um, not only that, we sort of have developed a palate for it to where if you eat meat regularly and you try and stop, you're going to crave it and it's going to feel like you could never, ever live without it again. Like, I just got to have it, right? Um, it's just because your palate has been temporarily at least sort of uh, what, formed to crave and enjoy meat. And the idea of sort of giving up on meat just sounds just unfeasible. I just, I just couldn't do it. Like, I can't imagine not doing that. Um, so that's a kind of bias that we have. We sort of think, part of the bias is we falsely think that our palate is sort of unchangeable. Like, in the, the cravings you have now are the cravings you always have. And that, that's actually not true. Um, uh, next little bullet point uh, is meat, sex, and gender. This is, I think, really interesting. So there's a whole book called The Sexual Politics of Meat um, by Carol Adams. It's not a new book. But it's all about how, if you just look at the way women are depicted in our culture, there are all these meat connotations, right? And men are the consumers, right? It's very odd, and it's very uncomfortable to even, there's, you just, you just look at the book, uh, The Sexual Politics of Meat, and you'll realize, whoa, <laughs> it's full of pictures that'll make you uncomfortable. Not because they're pornographic, just because they show you how women are depicted vis-a-vis -vis food and uh, the consumer culture and so on. Um, and the other side of it is, uh, you know, there's this, there's this idea that, well, if you're a manly man, you'll eat beef. It's what's for dinner, right? That real men eat a lot of red meat or something like that, right? And I, I'm only slightly overstating it, right? I mean, we've all heard this idea, you thump your chest, right? Um, like if, uh, so just, for the men in the room, uh, imagine sort of becoming a vegan, right? And telling all your friends, hey, uh, I'm a vegan now, right? I, I'm guessing, what's that? Are you one? I like a vegan one. Right, yes. <laughs> I'm a vegan. Uh, I imagine that what you would, I'm guessing that what you would imagine is that your masculinity is under threat if you were to do that, right? That somehow you'd be like, hey guys, I'm, I'm still like, you know, a strong guy and I still have testosterone and all that stuff, but whatever. I'm not trying to be weird or sexist or anything. I'm just saying it's, it's a real thing. And the fact that you guys are all grinning is telling me I'm right about it. Um, there's also this idea that if you're sort of compassionate to animals, if you're sensitive, right? That if, you know, if you'd rather not squash the ant that's crawling across the picnic table, that somehow you're a softy or a sissy or somehow not strong-minded or something like that. It's actually, I mean, how many of you, yes, know what I'm talking about here? Okay, right? There's this sort of prejudice in a way that being a compassionate person goes along with being irrational or soft-minded or that there's generally something wrong with you, right? Um, which, uh, for, for Christians, that ought to be a real concern. I mean, if, if we should be anything, we should be compassionate, right? Um, and compassion shouldn't 
uh, arguably, will come at, this, at the end of my hand that you'll see. Um, I don't think compassion should be sort of limited to other human beings, right? That to, be, to be fully compassionate means to be compassionate across the board, right? And we shouldn't be embarrassed about that. We shouldn't feel that somehow we're weak or soft if we are sad to see uh, a, bug, a bug unnecessarily squashed. I mean, really. My, my kids like to squash bugs in the backyard sometimes. I'm like, like what's why? I mean, I mean, I don't think they feel pain or anything like that, but I just, it seems gratuitous to me, right? And even saying just what I said, I feel uncomfortable <laughs> for the very reasons I was just mentioning. Like, you know, what are they going to think? I think I'm soft or something. Whatever. Um, that's a real thing. All these are biases, though, um, that make it hard for us, I think, to uh, like objectively think about the issue here, the moral issue about eating animals. Because we, we, we live in this world with all this pressure on it. Um, the last idea there is called willful blindness. Um, and this is the idea that we, the human beings have this tendency to sort of look away from, from things that uh, uh, are uncomfortable for us to see in the sense of, well, if I look, if I look, um, if I look too carefully at that argument over there, or if I go read a book on sort of why you shouldn't eat animals, I don't want to because I might find it convicting, <laughs> right? So our, our own sort of uh, pride, our own sense of, you know, I, I just, I want to preserve my wants. I don't want the things, I want to sort of maintain the desires and preferences I have, and I want to insulate them from, from criticism, right? So I'll just keep looking away from from ideas or images that might threaten them. Um, so we, when we have cognitive dissonance, we just try and ignore one of the things, right? Uh, here's an example of this. When I was at Notre Dame, one of my professors, who's like a world-class ethicist, right? And he was born in Texas. In fact, he was born like three miles from where my mother was born on a farm in the middle of Texas. Um, Shive, anybody heard of Shive, Texas? No, dirt road town. Um, he was, so he's like a, you know, a red-blooded Texan and a professional ethicist. <laughs> and uh, when I was at Notre Dame, I, I was teaching a class um, on food ethics. And I went to him. I said, hey, David, um, have you read this book you know, by, I think I said Michael Scully or something like that. Uh, and he's like, oh, wait, wait. Is that that book where he's arguing uh, you know, against that we should radically cut back on eating meat for moral reasons? Like, yeah, I was like, have you read it? It's really, he's like, oh, stop, just, Robert, don't say anything more. I don't, I don't want to hear it. Because <laughs> uh, if you keep talking to me and somebody says, you know, you're going to make me really uncomfortable and I, you know, I just want to keep eating what I'm eating. And, he, you know, he had a smile. He was, he was smiling about it. But he was serious, too, you know. <laughs> um, that's just an example, right? So be, even being like a professional ethicist, uh, doesn't make you immune to these things. Um, okay. Uh, next kind of epistemic issue, I just have dialectical matters as a catch-all phrase. Um, the first one is just what I'm saying using the term evidential standards. Um, so it's common for somebody to say like, well, we don't know for certain that, and just put anything in the blank there, right? I, and, and the idea is that the lack of certainty about X is relevant in some interesting way when it comes to the ethics concerning eating or not eating X. Um, and the, the problem is it's just not that relevant. We, you know, we don't have certainty about most things um, and we don't require it for rational belief in most things. Um, so what we want to know is, well, why? Why does it matter if we don't know for certain, right? So somebody could say, um, in fact, I had a, I had a professor who's uh, in the, he's an expert in brain uh, neurology, I forget other stuff. And we were talking about this, and he said, look, we don't, we, we don't know for sure that, that animals are sentient or can feel pain. I'm like, really? Okay. Um, we had an interesting discussion about it, and he had interesting things to say, but, um, but it became clear that it was this... Um, Somehow the fact that the, the case for the sentience of, say, pigs 
that the case hasn't sort of achieved some high bar of, of, of evidence that somehow until it gets past that bar, we can just proceed as, as normal, right? It's just a weird thing to say. I mean, uh, and it sounds uh, very convenient to say that too, right? When we're talking about something that we're so involved in, like eating, right? So um, because this question about what we should eat um, is unavoidable, um, it's, a, it's a kind of a fun one to talk about because we all feel the tension. Um, and it's easy to see our biases. Um, um, I'm going to skip the, the third one there, the precautionary principles. Um, these are important in environmental ethics. They play a huge role in environmental ethics. Um, and the sort of slogan version is, it's better to be safe than sorry. Um, but there are, about, there are like 12 different like, formulations of the precautionary principle. And uh, it's, it gets really interesting. But the rough idea is the one I, I tried to write down there. I put it like this. If there's the real possibility that doing X causes serious harm, then the lack of full certainty should not be used as a reason for not abstaining from doing X, right? In other words, if the stakes are high, uh, we should err on the side of caution, right? So just to put it in a concrete case, uh, we don't know for sure whether salmon are sentient, right? Uh, the evidence is starting to suggest that they are. Uh, well, what should we do? You want to correct me on that? No, I want okay. you to explain what sentience means. Uh, having a cognitive, being able to feel things, sense things, to have a mental life. How about this, to be able to feel pain? Yeah. So let it just go with being able to feel pain. Yeah. So uh, can salmon feel pain? Well, uh, we don't know for sure, uh, but the evidence is starting to suggest that maybe they do, right? Um, well, what do we do now, right? So if, if you want to run a precautionary kind of argument, you'd say, look, um, if we're wrong about this, then we're causing a lot of pain to salmon, right? So we should err on the side of caution and not eat them, right? Or, not, or find ways to eat them that involves less, uh, less infliction of pain or something like that. You see the idea. I, this isn't about salmon. I'm just trying to give it an argument where we don't know a whole lot but uh, you might think we should err on the side of caution. It's easy to think of clear-cut examples where the precautionary principle is at work, like, well, you want to blow up that building over there, you want to demolish it, right? And you're about to like, flip the switch, and somebody says, wait, 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 I think I saw uh, something move in that upper window. Well, it might just have been a bird or whatever, but it might be a person, right? So given that the stakes are, Err on the side of caution. Don't blow it up yet, right? Simple case. Um, so uh, many people think that just for the sake of a precautionary type argument that we should abstain from lots of things that we currently do, just because for all we know, uh, we're inflicting loads of pain and suffering on, on other creatures. Um, OK. The last one, and this is my favorite one, uh, confessions versus arguments. I have this on here only because I've taught this stuff so many times that I like to anticipate what my students are going to say. <laughs> and uh, they always say this kind of thing, right? Uh, you, have them, you have them read some paper on, on animal welfare, whether she animals, eat animals. And you have some, some debates happening in class. And uh, two students are arguing about it. And one finally says, look, Fine, yeah, you have a good argument that I shouldn't eat meat, but I'm still going to eat meat. Like, I'm not giving it up, right? Uh, you can imagine this happening, right? You can imagine being that person. Um, but of course, that's interesting by way of a sort of biographical fact or a confession on your part, but it's not an argument, right? So don't confuse uh, this prediction that you're unable to sort of act in accord with reason <laughs> with an argument. It's just not an argument, right? Does that make sense? Um, but you'll be tempted to do it. If you, if you look into this debate, you'll find yourself wanting to like, form your final verdicts based upon sort of what you want the outcomes to be, right? It's, it's 
it's a real bias that we have on this. Okay. Uh, the last kind of issue are the ontological issues. Um, do ecosystems exist? What does it take to be a person? And the other one, what things have intrinsic moral value? Okay. Um, this last question about what things have intrinsic moral value, that's the, that's the crucial question uh, in environmental ethics. Um, and to see, we'll move to the next section here, to see what that question means, um, you need to sort of see that there's this distinction between two kinds of value. So philosophers make this distinction between instrumental value on the one hand and intrinsic, or sometimes they call it final value on the other. So uh, instrumental value is the value that something has for some, to do some work for you. So a doorstop has instrumental value. A dollar bill has instrumental value. You know, you don't, you don't sort of, there's nothing intrinsically all that valuable about a dollar bill. What's valuable about it is that it can sort of get you something, right? It has a use, right? So its, it's value is value for something else. Does that make sense? Um, so many things, almost m most things, have some kind of instrumental value, including you. I could use you as a doorstop, right? Uh, but the question is whether you have non-instrumental value as well, right? So the question is, uh, what sorts of things have what we call intrinsic or final value? And that's sort of the value that something has just in and of itself, just for being what it is, not because it can do some good in the world or because of anything else, just given the thing that it is, right? That's intrinsic value. Now, the the paradigm example of things with intrinsic value are persons, right? So human persons are, uh, especially if you limit it, just to make it uncontroversial, to just say the people in this room, right? That is mature, fully, rather fully functioning, as far as I could tell, uh, human beings. Uh, you know, you're sort of uncontroversial examples of things that have intrinsic moral value, right? So. And what follows from that is like, well, then I, it's, not, it's wrong for me to treat you as if you didn't have intrinsic value, but to only value you for what you could do for me or somebody else. Right? So if I treat persons as just being good for society right, and ignore the value they have in and of themselves, I'm failing to treat them as if they have intrinsic value. Right? Does that make sense? So. Uh, we sort of let ourselves into this uh, category, things with intrinsic value, because we think we all count. Um, and the, the question really is, uh, what else is in this box, the things that have intrinsic moral value, right? Um, and that's the, the question there is, that's called the question of the moral community. So the, the phrase, the moral community, is just a funny way to talk about, you know, the set of all things that have intrinsic moral value. So what's in the moral community, right? We're in, most of us. I say most because there are, there are cases that are, that are controversial, right? So a human fetus, does it have intrinsic moral value or not? Obviously, that's very controversial. Uh, what about late stage Parkinson's people? Do they have intrinsic moral value? Another difficult case. What about people in comas or so on? Um, you might think, you might have an answer in your head to that. I'm just saying those, those are actually called marginal cases because you know, they're not uncontroversial at the very least, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so the key question is uh, who or what belongs to the moral community, right? And whatever you put into the moral community, or so that's a metaphor, whatever belongs to the moral community, right? Uh, if you say something belongs to the moral community, you are saying that that thing has intrinsic moral value and deserves our moral consideration. That is, there are ways that you shouldn't treat it, right? That's just, that's what it means to belong to the moral community. Um, so uh, if you're in the moral community, you have uh, moral standing, right? You're, you're something that deserves moral consideration. Uh, we can't just treat you like a mere means to an end or something like that. Okay. Um, so the big questions are who or what belongs to the moral community? And then other questions are things like, well, are there degrees of intrinsic value, right? So within the moral community, can you have rankings, right? These, these things all have intrinsic moral value, but uh, 
having intrinsic value doesn't mean having sort of equal amounts of value, if you could put it that way, right? So just to give you an example, you might think that, yeah, all human beings have intrinsic moral value. They all belong to the moral community. But so do, and then you could add something else. Let's just go with dolphins. Um, dolphins also have intrinsic moral value. So you know, you got dolphins and human beings in the moral community. Um, and ignore what else is in there. You could then go on to say, at least conceptually, but human beings have sort of a, a different kind of value. It's a greater kind of value or whatever. Everything in there has value in and of itself, but you might think that there are, there's sort of a ranking inside that class. Um, that's, that's a hard question, right? Because then you have to answer, well, what makes for the ranking? Like on what basis is there this ranking? Um, uh, right. And then um, the, the third question that's hard about the moral community is sort of, it's easy to say, um, well, we count. Humans are the paradigm examples, right? What's hard to say is, well, why, right? Why do we count? <laughs> like, what are the conditions that we satisfy uh, uh, in virtue of which we belong to this community, right? Now, one answer, and this just called, it has a name, it's called speciesism. One answer is just, well, I'm a human being. I'm in Homo sapiens. That's the condition that make, gives me intrinsic moral value, right? Um, it's called speciesism because it's thought to be as uh, biased as racism. You're simply arbitrary, arbitrarily privileging, pri privileging sorry, a species, right, without you know, identifying some interesting features of that species. So um, most people who work in environmental ethics reject speciesism and say, we need to say what forms the moral community, and it can't just be belonging to some such and such species, right? Because that looks rather arbitrary. Um, so different answers have been tried, um, and uh, a leading one is, well, things that have Sentience is one example, capacity to feel pain. Uh, another example is we have to be a moral agent, right? You have to be, have some sort of agency and moral beliefs and convictions. You have to have a concept of right and wrong to belong to the moral community. That's another answer. Um, uh, you have to be a living thing. That's another one. Um, okay. Um, I actually just sketched a few of the main views about the moral community. Um, how am I doing on time? I feel like I'm talking fast and running out of time. 20 more minutes. OK. Is that for total, total? Because I want to leave some time for discussion. Um, 20 minutes plus we can have another 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, um, we started late, too. So yeah. all right. Um, if you're getting worn out, just sort of yawn really loudly, and I'll get the hint. Um, so there's this inter interesting thought experiment that uh, gets a lot of use. I use it in my classes. It's called the last. It's called the last man argument. I call it the last person argument. Um, and so the idea is you're supposed to imagine that you're the last human being on Earth, right? Forget how, because this is a thought experiment. You just have to go with the assumptions here. You're the last person. And um, you um, are looking around, and you discover, oh, here's this contraption somebody left. And if I push this button here, I will destroy permanently all other life forms, plants, animals, and so on, all landscapes. Basically, you're just going to level the planet, like flat, flat line the whole thing. You, so you have the power to do this, right? Um, so would it be wrong to do it? That's the, that's the question. I think I said everything I need to say to stage it up, stage it. Um, yeah. Would this act be morally wrong or not? I'm curious, what do you think? How many thinks yes, it'd be, how about this? How many think it's morally permissible? Sure. Can't do anything wrong. How many of you think, feel strongly that it's morally wrong? How many are like, oh man, I hate these kinds of trick questions. It's going to get me. <laughs> There's no trap in this question. I should say it's not like a gotcha question. Um, 
it's a diagnostic question or thought experiment in the sense that um, uh, if you think that there's nothing wrong with it, right, then uh, this is how the, it's explained. Um, then you're saying that there's nothing wrong with just annihilating all these other life forms, right? You're not annihilating, you're not killing off any human beings, right? So, um, so you might think, well, the only kinds of the only kinds of things that can be subject to moral wrongs are human beings. There are none of those around except for me. Um, and just assume suicide's okay, uh, just for the sake of the argument, unless that's why you thought it was wrong. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, for other than the suicide question, um, would it be morally wrong? It's like a dead hands, but when you die, you are implied with the sun. Yeah, yeah. You could do it that way. Yeah, good. Um, I'll take that in. I'll, do, I'll, I'll give it that way next time. Thanks. Um, if you think, no, there's something wrong about doing this, uh, then you probably are making an assumption that's really interesting, namely that non-human animals or things have moral standing and shouldn't be treated in a certain way. So those of you who said, yeah, I think it's morally wrong, does that, does that sound accurate to what you were thinking or was it some other reason? Yeah, um, that tends to be what people say is, people who say it's wrong, um, it turns out that they are, they are assuming that it's possible to do moral wrongs against non-humans, right? If you think that, uh, then you're holding to an interesting view. That's a popular view, so you're, there's nothing wrong with it in a way. But, um, so look at this list here, and you'll see how these different views will give different verdicts on the last person case. So the main views, um, the first pair are just called anthropocentric views, um, and they're strong anthropocentrism. That's just the claim that only human beings have intrinsic moral value, right? So the only things that have intrinsic moral value, that's us, right? Uh, weak anthropocentrism says, yes, we have intrinsic moral value, but so do other things. Right, and they just have less, maybe. Uh, sentientism is the view that sentient beings have intrinsic moral value, right? So yes, we count, but so do dolphins, right? Um, and what bears, I guess, whatever else you're annihilating in the last person. Biocentric individualism uh, widens the scope even uh, even more and says not just. Uh, persons, but also um, not just sentient beings, but just anything that's living, right? So slugs, right? Plants, all those, anything that's alive, right? And of course, it's tricky to say what it means to be alive, right? That's, they know that's a problem. They know it's a, a question, and it's partly an empirical question, right? Um, and then, uh, Environmental holism, there are two forms of this, and they're radically different. So pure holism says that only holistic entities have intrinsic moral value. So a holistic entity, there's two leading examples. One are ecosystems, and the other are species themselves, right? So ecosystems, well, you go, go to the George Bush pond. Uh, if there are ecosystems, there's probably one there, right? The, the Bush pond ecosystem. It's got catfish in it, you know, and other stuff. It's a good place to fish. Um, there's stuff in there, right? It's an ecosystem. Um, so according to uh, holistic views, those things are among the things that have intrinsic moral value. So you can do, you can, you can do things to ecosystems that are, uh, count as morally wrongful things to do, right? So you can have obligations to ecosystems. They, there are certain things that you shouldn't do to ecosystems. Right? Maybe you should preserve them, right, and so on. The other kind of holistic entity is a species. And here we're just talking about, we talk about the preservation of the species, right? Um, don't, don't let species go extinct, right? We don't care so much about the particular individuals of a species. We're talking about the species itself, right? If that makes sense to you. It's a tricky, It'd be like saying, um, uh, I care that the Dallas Cowboys stay in existence. I don't care who's on the team. I just want the Cowboys to stick around, right? Uh, that, the Cowboys, in that sense, is a holistic entity. Um, and no, I don't think. 
I'm a skeptic about teams, too. <laughs> there are no football teams. They're just players. Uh, arranged team-wise, that's the thing. Of, yeah. Now you think I'm weird. Um, um, OK, so those are the main views. Um, now, a good question is, uh, which of these views, if any, um, is best fits within a Christian framework or a Christian worldview? Um, I'm going to let you think about that. Um, so now we have our, our, we're back to the main moral question about under what conditions it's, if any, it's morally permissible to eat animals. Um, so these different views will give different verdicts, right? So if you're a strong anthropocentrist, um, it's on your view, animals do not have any moral standing, right? So uh, it's much harder on that kind of view to come up with any cases where that count, that really count as morally wrongful treatment of animals, right? The best, usually the best you can do is something like what Immanuel Kant would say is, well, um, if your dog walks into the room and I kick it, right? Have I done anything morally wrong? Yes, because I've kicked your property. <laughs> All right, so animal, you can mistreat animals only insofar as they're the property of, an, of a human being or a rational agent. But if you walk out into the woods and there's some stray dog, doesn't belong to anybody, and you kick it, you haven't done anything morally wrong. It right? doesn't belong to anybody. Um, so that's, that's one thing a strong anthropocentrist could say, right? Um, pretty counterintuitive, I think. Um, uh, that's, so that's one, one way forward. Um, the weak anthropocentrist, um, uh, she doesn't say a whole lot other than to say that non-human animals have some kind of intrinsic moral value. So it's, it's just a question of, well, which, which animals do and how much and, and you know, um, uh, under what conditions is it morally wrong now, right? They're, they're eligible for mistreatment, if I could put it that way, but it'll just depend upon the specific circumstances. Um, okay. Um, other relevant Christian principles here, um, and these will, I think, all be familiar to you, I, I think, but there's the Imago Dei doctrine. So uh, traditional Christian theology says that human beings are created in the image of God. Um, and that's supposed to come with some kind of uh, um, function to it. So there's a whole, there's different interpretations of the Imago Dei doctrine. One's called the functional view, and on that view, what it means to the be in the Imago Dei is to have a certain sort of role that you're supposed to play in the created order. Um, you're supposed to be a steward, for example, of creation. That's that's one way of one way of thinking of it, or one aspect of the idea. Um, then there's the dominion text from Genesis: um, "Be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth." Right. Um, this is one of the most sort of notorious texts because this notion of dominion um, has been used in many cases uh, to justify uh, domination and not merely dominion in a kingly kind of sense. So uh, one reading of dominion is uh, the kind of dominion that a good king would have over his constituents or a good queen, right? Which means you, you take care of them, right? You don't use them. You don't lord it over them. Rather, you, you do things to bring about their flourishing. You're, you're a good steward of them. Does that make sense? So that's, um, arguably, that's, what's, that's the proper interpretation of the, of the phrase, though it's somewhat controversial. The third idea here is um, what C.S. Lewis calls the ultimate law. Um, what somebody else called the doctrine of dying into life. Um, and uh, it, it comes from many places in the, in the Gospels, but here's just one place from Matthew where Jesus says, For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Right. So one way to put this is the, we're told by Jesus, and, and by the way, this is found in many, many other religious traditions too, that the way to human flourishment and happiness is through self-sacrifice, right? So by dying to self. 
that that's the way to life, right? It sounds paradoxical, it kind of is, um, and it's arguably at the essence of Christianity. You can't have Christianity uh, without that idea. Um, so think about that principle, though, within the context of uh, this discussion, right? So if you ask, what, how should we care for and relate to non-human animals, right? Um, what does it mean, right? If you're, if you're dying to self, right, living a life of self-sacrifice, um, which doesn't mean, of course, that you um, just beat yourself up all the time or whatever, but I just mean in the, in the sort of, in the way that it's meant without going into details. Um, what, what does that look like with respect to, if you're living that principle out, how are you gonna relate to animals, right? Are you gonna be like, well, hey, I like the taste of them, so I'm just gonna, I don't need to eat them, I can meet my nutritional needs you know, without them or without nearly as much of them, but I, you know, sure like those savory baby back ribs, right? I mean, I'm not trying to make an argument, and it's not really a rhetorical question, though it may have sounded like one, but because it had an edge to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of natural to think that dying to self requires um, a way of relating to non-human animals, right? Uh, where you, you look out for them and you don't just use them for your own benefit. Uh, the last thing on my little bullet point list is Jesus ate fish. <laughs> so uh, it always comes up, well, Jesus ate fish. Right? As if that's supposed to, as, as if it's supposed to follow from that, that we can eat whatever we want. Um, it doesn't follow. Um, it's relevant, right? You have to kind of think about what's the relevant of anecdotal bits like that. Um, I think the, what's helpful here at this point is to say that there are, there are really two kinds of, two families of views about many things, including eating animals, the ethics of it. And one is what you might call an unconditional view. And it just says, uh, it's always, no matter what, wrong to eat an animal. Right, just without any qualification. Um, I know I don't I don't know anybody that holds that view. Um, that's really a kind of caricature of of the view that most people defend, who sort of take these issues seriously. the The view you usually get is something that you call a conditional kind of view, and you may have already got a hint of it already. So if you say, "Look, um, it's morally wrong to eat animals." Um, in conditions where it's not nutritionally or otherwise necessary, right? So if you're stranded on an island and somehow a turkey lands and uh, you got nothing else to eat, all the coconuts are gone, no more shrimp and so on, uh, is it more the wrong to eat that turkey? Well, probably not, right? Um, or at least you could say that. Uh, even some ethical vegetarians and vegans would say that, right? It's just a way of saying it just depends upon the, the context, what your needs are, and what means you have to meet them, right? So if you can meet all of your nutritional needs without eating animal products, um, that puts you in a certain kind of context, right? If that's the case, right? Or if you meet them by only eating just a little bit, right? So the one hot dog a week will meet all your animal protein needs. Um, <laughs> well, uh, is it morally permissible to eat more than that? That's, that's the kind of question that is relevant for this. Um, there's some great quotes here at the end by two Christian philosophers. One, uh, sorry, one's a philosopher, one's a, a uh, speechwriter. Matthew Scully, he was one of George Bush's speechwriters. Um, he has a book called Dominion. Uh, and then Matthew Halteman, he was actually one of my classmates at Notre Dame. We, we're not really friends. We're not enemies either. Just we weren't. <laughs> Never really hung out. He says this, and I'll just, I'll just leave with this. He says, um, one of the perennial temptations that Christians have faced throughout the history of the church is that of living as if the good news of the gospel of Jesus, God's promise to redeem and transform all of creation, is relevant only to human beings. As the narrative goes, in fact, the first dignity God bestows upon human beings, our very first opportunity to exercise the love, power, and creativity the divine image within us 
is the charge to care for the natural world and the animal creatures with whom we share it. So. I'll leave you with that. So I didn't answer any major questions, but I hope I gave you enough to help you think more carefully about uh, environmental issues, especially about eating, whether and when we should eat animals. Any questions or? So I have a question. Um, it seems to me an additional complication is distinguish, uh, distinguishing between values and duties, because um, especially when we're talking about living things, for example, or I guess basically any way you parse out the moral value, um, it seems intuitive that there will be varying duties that are kind of you know, produced as a result of, the, of, uh, of us ascribing moral value to something, right? Of there being being moral value there, or yeah. So if you said ascribing, I don't know if that was yeah. Well, uh, if we presume that things have okay. more, a set of things have moral value. In most sets that we choose, there will be things we probably won't think we have the same duty to all of those things. So, like, if we take the position that all life holds some moral value, we're unlikely to think that the value of a cat and of a cockroach are the same, right? Right. Um, even though we think they do have value. Yeah. So then you have to ask the question: Is you know how how are we getting duties from the values? Like, how are we actually deciding? how the value, moral value, the moral status of things should affect our behavior. Yeah. So if you, suppose you're somebody who thinks that um, lots of things have intrinsic moral value, cockroaches, cats, persons. Um, how do you go from that conviction to a sense of what your relative and respective duties are here? Um, I don't, I don't know. You would have to come up with, uh, I mean, people have worked these things out. So I, I'm not going to be able to try and work it all out here. Um, but you would have to think about, so if, if certain things have more intrinsic value, well, on what basis do they have more intrinsic value, right? Um, and the difference is, what makes, those, what makes for those differences is going to be relevant to the kinds of duties that you have, right? Um, but... Uh, I guess one of the things that I find myself drawn to is just the idea that there are lots of things that are complicated about, it, gee, this is the question you raised, it's very complicated, hard, hard to know what to say. Um, but so long as you begin with the idea that, that there is intrinsic value in non-human creatures, right? Um, then it's going to follow that we have some kinds of moral obligations to them, right? Now, what those exact obligations look like, how demanding they are, for example, um, is going to be a sort of a, a question that's downstream, really, of kind of this debate, right? So um, maybe if, I, if I'm not making much sense, one way to put it is your question is downstream of the question that, that needs to be tackled first, right? Uh, about which there's lots of disagreement, about which Christians haven't really thought very carefully, right? Do non-human animals have any moral value, right? Um, yeah, if we, could, if we could, speaking as someone who thinks that they do, um, uh, if we could just get more people to sort of agree on that and sort of see it to be the case, then we could sort of worry about those kinds of questions, right? Um, that'd be that's part of what I would say. Although I, mean, I think at the same time, though, ultimately what we care about isn't whether or not they have moral value, but how the, how we should behave, right? I mean, isn't that the ultimate goal? How, how did, how, I don't think that's the only thing we care about. I mean, I think it's, it's not the only thing. okay. But it, but in the in the question here, should we eat animals? Right. Yeah. The, the practical is, question. Should we actually eat it? So right. That, you know, that is a duty, right? Yeah. Yeah. So how about, how about this? Suppose you said, look, um, plants, uh, how have we sort of, uh, sort of come up with our fine-tuned little judgments about the relative values? Uh, plants are going to be lower, right? If they have any intrinsic value at all, it's going to be less than animals, right? 
uh, that seems right to me. Like if we're, if we're expanding the moral community to include animals, uh, if plants get in, they're gonna have less than animals, right? Okay. Um, then it's pretty easy to see that, well, if we, can, if we can meet all our nutritional needs without any animals, just eat the plants, then that looks like we have an obligation to do that. So without even you know, figuring out the details, we can see the bigger implications, uh, which have clear practical sort of upshots for us. Um, does that make sense? So I get there's a real concern about how you move from the value assignments to what to eat. And I think that you don't need a very fine-grained set of value assignments to get there. You just have a coarse-grained one is sufficient. Um, yeah. I was wondering, uh, when you were talking about the two kinds of value, like instrumental and intrinsic, it's obviously a question, but like, for example, a flower or a plant of some sort, I'm assuming specifically a flower, like instrumental value, like I was wondering which type would a flower fall into? Because like you could give flowers to someone that's instrumental, but does it have value in and of itself because it's a flower? Like, is there an answer yeah. to that? Yeah, so it certainly has instrumental value because it's, uh, we enjoy them. Uh, what kind of intrinsic value might it have? Um, it's beautiful, <clears throat> so it can have aesthetic intrinsic value, right? That just means uh, the beauty of the flower, um, it, it has a, in virtue of being beautiful, it has a kind of value that's just, it has in and of itself. Even if nobody was around to enjoy it, it would still be valuable. That, but that's, a, that's not a moral value, that's an aesthetic value. Um, so whether a flower has intrinsic moral value, it's different. And it, if you say it has moral value, it means that we have certain obligations uh, to treat it or not treat it in certain ways. Um, and to be honest, that's a harder sell. I, I, at that point, I, I kind of care less about the question. This is a, a confession. And it just seems harder to answer, right? Um, my, but my, my basic sense is, even if flowers have intrinsic moral value, it's not going to be on the level of a, living, of a, of a sentient being. And for me, that's enough to, to get practical guidance out of it. Am I answering the question you want? Yeah, because even if it has intrinsic value because it's beautiful and that gives it aesthetic value, if you step on it or like crush it or ruin it, you're not morally like in the wrong. To That's right. That. If it's only aesthetic value, right? We got time for like one more comment or question. I guess uh, I think we kind of brought it up a little bit with the earlier discussion, but how exactly would we um, parse out the value of various things? So how 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 do exact like how do we quantify say human is worth more than this animal which is worth more than this plant which is worth more than this rock or whatever right I don't know if you I don't know if asking for it to be quantified is or, or, well um, how do we maybe break it down I guess I yeah um, it's the same question in a way uh, so. We can make judgments about sort of the relative ordering of things, even if we can't give precise judgments about the proportions between them, if I can put it that way. So I can say, ah, this one's bigger than that one, even if I can tell you how much bigger it is, right? So I don't think to, to get a scale of value, we have to have, like I was saying, a fine-grained grip on what the precise values are. How much more valuable is a dolphin than a rat? I don't know, right? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I guess um, the fact that I don't know and the fact that I think it's hard to figure out doesn't lead me to think that there's no value there. It just makes me think, ah, it's just a tough question. I guess what I'm getting at is um, what, why are you asking your question? Like, are you asking, you might ask it, here, here's, you might have a worry in mind. The worry would be, look, if we can't, if we can't give and sort of say what the sort of exact rankings are, then we don't have any grounds for thinking that there's a ranking, right? And I don't, you weren't saying that, but if, if, if one were to give that argument, that objection, I would say what I said a minute ago, is that we can see relative differences without knowing precise steps along the way, right? So we don't need to have a, um, we can recognize differences without being able to see the precise sort of 
quantitative ratios and proportions between them. Does that make sense? I, but maybe you didn't have that kind of objection that you, in, in the background there. I guess it was kind of like that. Sorry. Or it was kind of, I guess, you, you mentioned maybe like the bigger thing. So you could see that one thing's bigger than another without necessarily knowing the exact gradation. I guess, but like, I guess I'm trying to get at like what, how, how exactly the yardstick works. So yeah. like with the bigger one, you can kind of like, okay, yeah, it, yeah. it's bigger. With, so it might just yeah. be an empirical question. So for example, if um, if if we were if we discovered that uh, salmon they have they can feel pain, but they have no long term or short term memory, right, of any sort of in any conscious. So when they're feeling pain, they don't also think, oh, I've been feeling pain for five minutes now. And they don't, they don't have any anticipation of pain, right? Um, that is, if you, uh, I forget their medical terms for these things, and people are in a state where they don't, they're unaware of the fact that they've been in pain for a long time, and they're not dreading the fact that they're going to continue to be in pain. Uh, apparently, it makes the pain more manageable, right? If there are creatures like that, um, then I think their pain, although it has sort of moral significance, um, if you have to choose between sort of inflicting pain on that kind of creature and inflicting pain on you, somebody who has a sort of a different register for pain, those seem like clear differences, right? That you're, you can rank the significance of their pain, um, and that will give you a, a ranking in sort of, um, sort of, you'd be, able to, you'd be able to tell, you know, what kinds of obligations you have if you have to choose between the two or so on. So part of your question, I think, um, we just don't, we just need more empirical information about the creatures we're talking about, what kind of cognitive lives they have. Um, but we don't, right? We don't, we don't know a whole lot. I mean, I'm not sure you can know what the cognitive lives are like just in general. Well, maybe forget the word no and just say um, we, we have very little to work with to, for, make, to, for making educated guesses. <laughs> That's true. I mean, usually what people say is, look, if the cognitive structures are similar and, and we know this one feels pain, then we have reason to think that this one feels pain. I mean, it's just analogy arguments. Unfortunately, um, we'll have to cut it about right there. Cut, uh, cut your pain off. Yes. <laughs>